Yeah, Guys, did, welcome back to Let's Be yeah, Frank, man. the home of men's Marking. mental health. Today, you're joining us as we are extremely excited to have the one and only George Coppin with us, a talented star in the acting scene, known for his remarkable performances, from pantomimes to hit, to hit Netflix films like The School for Good and Evil, and even joining Disney's magical world with Willow on Disney+. Plus. George has left a lasting impression. Beyond his comedy talents, George has been an advocate for important issues relating to actors with dwarfism in the film industry. With his wit, he raises critical questions about casting practices where roles traditionally meant for actors with dwarfism are given to others who have more opportunities, prompting him to address the quest for diversity and his impacts on mental health in the acting world. Join us for this thought-provoking discussion behind the curtains with George Coppin, actor, comedian and advocate for change. Today is going to be a very, very exciting episode and we are absolutely stoked to have him with us. But like, as always, we're going to jump on to Mr. Ryan Smith. Ryan, welcome, mate. I know this is a, a good friend of yours and uh, you've been extremely excited to uh, jump on good tonight friend. and record. I, uh, it's a, uh, I'd say more of an acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> Even that's no, stretching yeah. it. No, we don't like each other, not one bit. Nah. You know, it's no, it's absolutely brilliant that George has took the time out to um, discuss, uh, you know, uh, you know, some stuff that's happened in the past week. But obviously, we're here about mental health and stuff as well. So, but yeah, George, I am absolutely sort of humbled that you're here. You know, the huge Hollywood actor that you are. Um, yes, so welcome. Thank you for having me, lads. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. It's nice ah, to see good. you again, Ryan. It's been a while. It, it certainly has, hasn't it? You know, it was out of the blue that I uh, dropped you a message the other day, but it was just all yeah, this that dick pic was disgusting <laughs> and tiny. Mate, come on, this is a family <laughs> show. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. In. Yeah, a few times. Yeah. What? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so I said on I said on that episode the other week. Did I say it on that episode with uh, Phil Green the other week where I uh, did a bit of stand up comedy and stuff? Um, you know, I did a little, well, not a bit alongside George. Oh, comedy, stuff, we worked on it, was Comedy writing sessions together. Um, <laughs> you know, and 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 his, his jokes were as funny as they were were then, not very. So, <laughs> oh, oh, mate, just shots shots get shots fired, fired. Shots fired. Let's go. Not even, we've done two You're minutes You're glad yet. to over Zoom because I would so be whacking you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Your tiny oh, cock. It's, it's one of it's one of them it's one of them comedy scenes, isn't it? In, in sort of the Simpsons, where uh, the uh, little clown, you know, the the clown actor is, uh, yeah, trying to be funny, but he's not. <laughs> yeah, but then you fucked off, so we all got funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bring it, mate. Bring it. Let's it's go. <laughs> but George, tell us about yeah, move on. you. Move on. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know about kind of you outside of the acting and the comedy who is george coppin uh well i'm a very sociable person i love nothing more than going out with my mates i'd actually been with a day all day i like going out just to the pub on a friday saturday night you know having a few drinks and that's always been me a very confident very sociable person i never let anything especially my height get in the way i especially i use all the time i use it to my advantage especially my comedy and with my acting with how I act with people, because I know no matter what job I'm in, no matter what I do or say, I'm going to go outside and get stared at by kids. I'm going to get pointed at. There's nothing I can physically do to change that. So, like, I've just got to own it and ride with it. And, like, I'm one of those people who don't notice it. So, like, for example, my sister, because my whole family's dwarfs, you see, my sister, when she goes out in public, she'll notice everyone staring, everyone pointing, every single word said. Whereas me, it's just walked off my back, you know. My mates have said to me, oh, God, did you hear what that idiot just said to you? I'd be like, no, what do you say? Well, because it just washed it over me. You know, I'm used to it. Do you have yeah, anyone I mean, that... Again, I... with, with a quick <laughs> one on that, like, so with me and my kids, I like to kind of educate them. So have you had any families come up to you and just try and explain to their kids you know what dwarfism is or ask you questions or is it kind of just a a point and shoot sort of thing because i'd if because obviously my kids haven't met someone with dwarfism, with um dwarfism but i'd like to think in that opportunity yeah. i'd be able to take my kids up and go you know i do apologize but can you explain it to them so they can learn and then you, they're not growing up with that like oh let's just point and laugh because mm. it's not nice it's not respectful it's not human do you know what i mean like no. 
Just be nice and curious. And well, if most you don't of the time know it's about in, like, ask a question. Yeah. Well, most of the time it's in like a queue for submit when the kid will ask them. And the most of, the most common uh, reply they get is the parents just going, oh, everyone's born different, you know. That's just how he's born. He's just born small. Like, you're born like this. You're born a boy. You're born a girl. He's just born differently. Everyone's like that. And then they just kind of move on. But I don't think parents aren't sure going, can we talk about it in front of them? Can we? Do I have to like shush them up? It's like, no, no, like I'm more than happy for them to ask me questions. And sometimes the kids will just ignore the parents or just come up to me and go, Why are you small? So I'll just explain, I go, Oh, yeah, I'm a dwarf, you know. So obviously, if I go deep into it, the kid will look at me going, The fuck are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have to like try and put it in a kid's way, you know. But thankfully, a lot of adults, it's got better. Like a few, like years ago, I think the kid parents would be like, No, 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 don't look at him. Don't like, let's go, let's move. But now they're like, no, 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 let's talk about it. I'm, they want to educate their kids. I think I think sometimes parents think, I didn't get the education, get educated about disabled people, but I want my kids and grandkids to have that education about them. So, yeah, it's, it's just mainly that answer. And then especially grandparents will talk to me more openly than parents do for whatever reason. No, it's really, you know, it's really insightful, that is. And, and obviously... I know you a little bit, you know, per- I'm, I'll say a little bit personally, that sounds a bit... <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> sounds yeah. Like we're close that's it, never hide, Joe. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> right, no, but, um, you know, I, I've, I've been privileged enough to be able to get to know you and uh, and whatnot. And a couple of things, you know, we'll, we'll use the word dwarfism, but you're quite happy to use the term dwarf. Now, some people turn around and say, oh, you can't say dwarf and stuff like that. But, do, you know, do you actually find that, a derogatory statement or is it for, for me it's just a like a shorter version of dwarfism so again never hate yeah. joke thanks yeah, but like, it. Yeah. <laughs> everyone like in my industry in my uh, world has their own uh, favorite or own preference should i say like for example i don't mind being called a dwarf whereas someone like me like my mum prefers being called someone with dwarfism right you know, okay. so it's each of the own but for the majority of us the one word we hate and it's the only, it'll be the only time i ever say it it's the word midget yeah basically our n word and yeah. people wonder why and it's basically it refers back to the days when dwarfs were used in circus yeah when they were thrown about when they were used more as props than actors and part of the show they were like almost put in the cupboard for storage you know yeah that's what it refers back to and a lot of people don't understand that but yeah i have friends i know dwarfs who don't mind the n word so it's like fair enough you know each to their own yeah, so there's like, yeah. or someone with restricted growth, you know, there's loads that are acceptable. That's a mouthful if you've had a drink, is not it? Somebody with restricted growth. I, 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 I couldn't do that. <laughs> Struggling with dwarfism, <laughs> that, mate. There's always must, seems to be drunk people that want to know everything. Yeah, yeah it, it will be. It's never been any good. Do you know what, though, as <laughs> yeah. well? Like, I didn't, I didn't know the, the reason behind um the m word do you know what i mean I, I didn't know that backstory and and again the people that are listening yeah i guarantee a lot of them didn't know the referencing behind the m word no, a lot of people don't and, it, again it's all it's all education and that's what we bring to the podcast is how to educate people and you know it, that's why it's great to have you on so yeah. we can educate people and we don't know but we could as we said off off air a minute ago we could well have a large audience with people suffering with dwarfism that and now could li- listen to yourself and go oh bloody hell that guy's done fucking amazing and it, it gives it gives them someone to kind of listen to as well um and that's what we want to bring that everyone's you know welcome and everyone needs to be heard and everyone has a story to tell yeah that's the main thing so how have you found then yeah because especially when i've sorry how, how have you found no, go on, sorry. your have you ever, has your dwarfism ever kind of impacted your life where you've kind of gone, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off that I'm, that I've got dwarfism, or have you kind of, because you seem quite relaxed around it as to go like, yep, yeah, this is me, happy with that, absolutely bob on, you know, I can go and smash the world. Has there ever, has there ever been a point where you've mm. gone, do you know what, it's, I've, I've lost that particular, I don't know role job or i can't is, is there anything that's kind of you've gone fuck's sake why me i'm always i've always said i'm always proud to be a dwarf you know it's one of the best things that ever well, it's the best thing that ever happened to me i've made friends through being a dwarf that i wouldn't have if i was average height 
But the one thing that does annoy me, obviously apart from people's attitudes, and it annoys every dwarf I know, is shopping. Because <laughs> whatever we need is on the top shelf, and there is no one ever about. And you're thinking, if I was just that bit taller, I would be able to get this and have no problem. But you've got to wait like 10 minutes for some random dude to come down and just go, mate, can you pass us the baked beans down? I've been waiting there for like 20 minutes. I'm really hungry. I want to go home. <laughs> I just want me baked beans. Just, you know. But Sorry, mate. I'm, I shouldn't be thinking this, but if you're I'm thinking, thinking the same thing as me, mate, trolley, we're mate, horrible. Ideal for you, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> I've just got an image of you. Just, <laughs> You've got Charlie's ideal for you in Lidl, haven't you? Sorry, no, mate. Lidl's the worst <sighs> one. We, me and my mum went to Lidl a few weeks ago, and the, the tails at Lidl are like twice the height of me. And me and my mum looked at it and went, "Oh, for fuck's sake!" I mean, the security guard. We could see it. You could see the security guard going. I can't, I can't do anything, and I really want to help him, and I can't. And I do try to look around, and go, can I? Any, any way I can help you? Yeah, there's the self checkout. Let me take you to the self checkout, <laughs> or let me get your basket on for you. And he's like, what the fuck? Incredible, incredible. I love, yeah. I love stories like Tell that. So something. If no, I walk in, down in fairness, Tesco and just look down an aisle to... and see George on the ladder, I'm going to be fisting myself, mate. I just think it'd be fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best advert ever. Now, what I do, I've learned to climb the shelves. <laughs> no, I climb the shelves. No, I do. Because especially if like one of the bottom ones empty, I just get climb up a few, and you can see a few people walking down, going, "What the fuck? There's a dwarf climbing the shelves." <laughs> and they go, "Do you want me to help you?" I'm like, "No, I'm almost there now. I've, I've climbed this high. I'm not." It took me two not... hours to get to this. Yeah, point. Yeah, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> I'm not stopping. This now. is my Everest. <laughs> yeah, and then I just get to top, get the item. Like, <laughs> you're gonna catch me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then have you not? Have you have you not actually thought about going in a Spider-Man outfit? <laughs> no, not yet. I might have to. I think I think I think it'll be a good one for you, mate. No, yeah, yeah. In... That way, it's spread around like wildfire. <laughs> Best YouTube channel ever. That is, mate. I'm TikTok talking videos, money, mate. I'll be big a... money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's my idea. I'll go fifty with you. But um, to give a serious answer on that question, I've been. Nights out where, um, for whatever reason, I'm not in a good mood for whatever has happened that day. And I just, for some reason, get loads of stares and loads of drunk comments. And it's like, fuck's sake, you know, just tonight, I can just do without all this crap. Yeah. Just click a button, just be average high, you know, so I can walk into a place and it'd be absolutely fine. Especially if it's a crowded pub as well, because there's like, oh, there's no chance I'm getting served in this pub, you know. And so I have to, like, find one of my mates, because most of my mates I hang out with, with are tall. So I said, great, just get us a drink. Well, yeah, I literally cannot get to this bar. And it's ridiculous. Even if I do manage to get to the front, no one can see me. And every the amount of times this always happens, where I'm at a till or I'm at a bar, and the woman serving will look up. And, like, they, people don't even think oh, to look down. No. They just look straight no. in their direction, in their eye line. It's like, hello. It's like, oh, uh, crap. And sometimes the person behind me is, not even noticed me at all, either. No. I started to go, oh, yeah, can I have this? I'm like, I'm literally right in front of you. Like, do you want, do you need a whack in the bollocks for me to, no- <laughs> you to notice me? Just a switch do you know what? Up. I think you should, I think that might be a, a, a new new tactic for you, mate. As you, you know, just... What do you mean, just, new? Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just think to yourself, oh, I didn't see you there. Like, you didn't yeah. see me type thing. I think, I think that might be the, the, the way forward and, and whatnot. But, you know, in all seriousness, what I want to do, though, is kind of, you know, you've kind of answered that, and I want to touch a little bit on recent news. And I only want to talk about this briefly, but I want to talk about acting and and sort of roles and things like that. And, and I know you've been in, you know, a few things and stuff. And but recently, there's been some, you know, with Disney bringing out Snow White. Uh, you know, the roles that have traditionally played, uh, you know, Pantomime by Dwarfs, um, and then obviously, Char- you know, pre- previous renditions of like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or Willy Wonka, or whatever you want to call it. And obviously this new sort of prequel that's coming out uh, with Hugh Grant playing an Uncle Lumpa. How has that kind of affected your mindset? With, with Do you think, well, what's the point? Or do you think, do you know what, this gives me more drive to go forwards? Do you, uh, where, where, where are you? both, should... really. I know that sounds like a weird answer, but it's a bit of like, I need to make a point. I need to make a statement to stop this. And, like, the feedback I've had has been mostly positive, and the comments I've had from people have been really nice, saying, oh, thank you for, try- for putting your voice out there. You're making a change. Thank you for speaking out uh, on our behalf. Or thank you for being you and 
getting your point across, being loud, because the louder you are, the more people will listen. Because a lot of people might just watch, watch and go, uh, well, my voice don't make a difference. It does. If I've learned anything this week, it's one opinion can spread like wildfire. Because I was not expecting my opinion on this to go as viral as it has. Because I just did one interview for Radio Derby, then suddenly main BBC News have picked it up and ITV News have picked it up. I got a text message from a friend the other day with a YouTube link. I was on the news in New Delhi, for God's sake. It's like, wow, this is mental. It's like, yeah, this has now gone a bit... Like, at the beginning, I was like, yeah, more, 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 more. And now I'm like, yeah, okay, this has gone a tiny bit too far. <laughs> like, a bloke in Norway wants a video, which I may have to say no to, even though I've been waiting, making him wait a while. But it's like, yeah, this is just getting bananas. And I've actually no, so... started to get <clears throat> spotted for it, as in uh, shopping was it yesterday. No, not yesterday. Friday, Friday or Thursday. I'd just been on the local news the night before. And a bloke said, oh, I saw you on the news. Brilliant. Well done. It's like, I'm getting recognised now. Yeah. And I was out uh, yesterday visiting an old friend at the Tramway Museum near where I live. And there was a queue. And again, the kid in front of me, to reference back to the previous question, was saying to his grandparents, oh, why is he small and all that? And a woman said, oh, you know, everyone's born different. It's like that guy that was on the radio, you know, talking about how dwarfs are. And then she turned to me and went, oh, you're not an entertainer, are you? I went, yeah, that was me on the radio. And she looked at me and go, sorry, what? I went, talking about Hugh Grant. She went, yeah, I went, yeah, that's me. And she looked at me and go, what, what are the chances of that? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, ma- massive. And, and so how does that kind of, you know, you think to yourself in, in roles like that, uh, I mean, I can't really talk. This is what I want to get you on. So I want to know what your headspace is. How does it actually make you feel inside when you see actors that could easily get pretty much their pick of, M- yeah. movie roles you know Hugh Grant is a massive pull- pulling power you know in, in that name alone how yeah. does that actually make you feel inside to think do you know what it, yeah it just I could have made I, I could have done something with that yeah it does make me feel a bit crap it's like thanks and I'm like you're like wanting to push us all of us out of this industry that we love you know yeah. this is a job it's a career we all want this is a job we all want and you're basically saying oh you you can't have a voice anymore you can't be on screen anymore we we're like almost ashamed of you yeah so you, you just go in that little corner yeah you just go in that corner and we'll all, we'll just carry on having fun being the big stars in the main room you know yeah it's, it's like no i don't i don't want to feel like that you know it's like yeah. um especially with this job with acting because how it works is they've got to ring my agent who then rings me so I, they have to come to me rather than i go to them yeah. and quite a few days because i can't do anything about it quite a few days i wake up just and the, the thought, of, first thought in my head would be like, you're going nowhere like fast in life, and it's like, and to put it bluntly, that's not a thought that fucks off quickly, exactly. you know, no. that weighs heavy on my mind all day. It's like, well, yeah, I'm not going anywhere in life quickly, and I can't do anything. I feel I'm stuck because basically they've shut them um, because they're not because I've always argued. My main argument has always been with this story. We should be getting offered the main roles, like what Hugh Grant gets, yes. you know, your everyday roles in your soaps, in your dramas, in your rom-coms, you know, but we're not getting those. So no. they kind of like shut one door on us, but forgot to open the next. Well, yeah, so we're I now mean, stuck for... in this limbo going, what do yeah. we do? But then it's like, again, in, in, the, in the quest for diversity, um, you know, and... and... I find myself. I do want to explore this with you, but I don't want to make it about this. Yeah, um, I know what you, mean. you know, in the in the quest for diversity, I, you know, we, you look at this Snow White that Disney have done, um, and roles again, like I said, traditionally played by dwarfs or you know actors with dwarfism and stuff, has been kind of given to a diverse array of people. You know, everybody is entitled to be, you know, to get yeah. their, you know, their art out there because that's what it is there. But by you know by actually creating this environment where we're trying to be so diverse we're actually going back in time and shutting the doors on actors like yourself and and you know you sharing your your art and stuff you know for, for me I, I think of um you know actors with dwarfism and I and I, and I automatically think Peter Dinklage uh, I automatically think Warwick Davis and, and yeah. whatnot and these are actors that have made it, but they're such a small part of what the what the industry is for you guys. Um, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. But yeah, like um, everyone, if you say as you just said, think say 
you say to anyone think of dwarf actors it's those two and yeah they've made it in life but what they've done is they've got up the ladder and then taken the ladder away the yeah. rest lot at the bottom going guys we still need that ladder please yeah. he, like especially peter dinklage because he said like in regards to snow white i've said i'm not gonna say any no. comment on that film until i see no, a trailer no. yeah, yeah. Until i see footage i've because everyone's made the same mistake with the leaked photo. Yeah. Everyone everyone said, oh, it's the seven dwarfs. They went, count the people. There's nine people in yeah. that photograph. And that's fair enough. And, and yeah, you know no what? one's I'm, counted. I'm people. quite happy for for me to be put right in, in things like that. Yeah. You know? It's like I say, I've only seen seen what's what's in the media and stuff. And yeah. And and you're quite right, you know, until there's footage out there, then let, let's let's stay shum. So, you know, I want to say thanks for, for highlighting that. And I really do appreciate that. That's okay. <laughs> Um, you know, because this is what the show is. It is education and stuff. Yeah. And I've not thought I'm, I'm not actually counted the people there. So yeah, no, really, a lot really, of people really, 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 really good. do that so, though. Um, a lot of people yeah, have that's... kind of seen the photo, and again, we're human. We jump to speculations, and we shouldn't. But it has happened before. I'm, I'm just saying, if you know, as I'm listening to you, just thinking back to films. So obviously, you had the Huntsman. Obviously, they were played. Um, like had the visual faces and that, so I think it was like Rob Brydon, um, the guy from Children of the Dead, yeah. I remember his name on top of my head. Uh, but there is, when is it then? There has to be, obviously, nowadays they literally go, right, we're going to do a film, and they have to tick every single freaking box because someone will say something. But when does it come down? Yeah. Excuse me. When does it come down to the actual acting? So how does it work in that sense? So if like obviously you, you've done some great stuff, how how does it work with regards to the acting side? So for me, okay, you know, Hugh Grant's playing this role. Well, if he's playing that role, is it because out of all the casting members he was the best, or is it because he is a bigger name? Like what? When is but, it? Like yeah, th- 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 there has to be a balance, surely. Well, like I do get a like if it's a huge crowd of dwarfs. Let's say an extra, like as goblins or gnomes, what we usually play. I would sometimes just get put forward for it without having to do anything. But then every now and again, I do have to do an uh, an audition, something called a self tape audition, which is all done at home. One of the worst things ever, because literally you and whoever's recording you have got to say a few lines. And if I'd done, if I'd had the uh, audition for Numpa Lumpa and not got it, I wouldn't be. I would be going, yeah, fair enough. You know, I didn't get the audition. Yeah. Whoever did. The, clearly were better than me that's absolutely fine move on but because we didn't even get a choice like as far as like i i still keep saying i've only seen the trailer so i've got no idea a there's other umplumps in the film and b if they are played by dwarfs if they if it turns out that other umplumpers played by dwarfs and hugh grant's just the main one i'll be like okay yeah that's fair enough a bit weird that hugh grant's the main one but okay there are dwarfs in it playing umplumpers but people forget it's our choice you know We've yeah. always got a voice. Like, I've been offered jobs in the past where I've gone, nah, I'm good, thanks, and turned it down. And it's like I was speaking to, I saw an old friend of mine yesterday who's a panto director who I've just worked with in Litchfield, and he says people moan at him when they do Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, going, oh, why are you getting dwarfs? And he goes, because they want to be here. We didn't force them. They want this career. They want this yeah. job. Like, we didn't go out on the street and went, yo, dwarf, come with me. Now dance, monkey, dance. You know, it's my, always my choice. And um, I love Panto. Panto is always my favourite job of the year. And if someone oh, said to me, okay. I'll, I'll talk to the sensible no, one, you me. I'll cut right off <laughs> two if, seconds. If, you, if someone <laughs> said to me, will you come and... <laughs> if so, someone said oh, to no, me, can you, come and, can you come and do Panto all year round for me, I'd bite their hand off. That would be my dream job. Like, like, it's hard work, don't get me wrong, but I yeah. absolutely love it. And, like, when I first put my post out, somebody who I thought was a friend called me selfish for doing panto. I'm like, no, I'm not. How dare you? How dare you call me selfish for doing a job I love? Just because you don't like it doesn't mean I don't have to like it. Like, for example, I've got uh, other dwarf friends who do, who get hired out for the stag dudes and the hen dudes. They dress as umpa lumpers and, le- and leprechauns. And but I don't, I'm not up against those events, but I have nothing wrong with my friends doing them. If that's no. what they want to do and they enjoy it, that's absolutely fine. All I ask is you don't get me involved, you know? And yeah. then people shouldn't be able to say, no, you can't do that because I disagree. And that's what, no, I totally like, agree. In and, 2023, and... you can't seem to have an opinion without no. someone having a go at you. And that's what I, find, I, I you know, I find 
I find upsetting that, you know, a lot of people in this world, they go, but you know what? I'm offended on that other person's behalf. Yeah. I'm offended. You know, I find that uh, cultural appropriation is, a, is a, one of my favorites. Well, have you actually spoke to the per- you know, somebody from that culture and, and, yeah. and said, you know, have you got their thought? Well, don't be offended on somebody else's, on somebody else's behalf. I just find that, you know, a little bit derogatory the, to the individuals. Um, so, yeah, uh, let, let's move on now. And I want to talk about anything coming up. Have you got any sort of gossip? Have you got any sort of uh, films that you're working on at the moment? Or, uh, do you know what I still haven't seen is where you play Cupid. Oh, you need to. It's a great film. Yeah. yeah. yeah obviously, because of the actors' strike in America, it's kind yeah. of paused everything okay. over here. So there's nothing going on at the minute this year. But uh, uh, me and all my other friends say this year's just been absolute crap for work. Right. Like, since Panto, I've done one job. Which okay. was um, it was on this film, this little film, no pun intended, of something I've been involved in since before COVID. Me and my dad did it, and it's basically this dark, twisted version of Snow White. So instead okay. of us rescuing her and kidnapping her, we uh, kidnap her. Sorry, rescuing her and saving her, we kidnap her and abuse her. You know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's called Snowfall. I think it's going to be out next year, hopefully. Right. And it's basically for the, it was originally for the London two students of the London Film School. Okay. As I said, we did it just for co lockdown, then lockdown happened, but then they graduated. They still wanted to do the film. So it's like okay. me, my dad, who's an actor as well, yeah. and another friend of ours. And then there's only about five of us filmed for about a week in London, which was good fun. We knew the other dwarf. Yeah. They always say in the world of actors and dwarfs, you either know a dwarf actor or you know of them. You know? Right. Like the amount of jobs I've gone to and I've pretty much known everyone it's like yeah good to see you again I'm you. it's like when me and my dad did the tv series of willow which yeah. if you want to watch it good luck it's not on disney plus anymore they took it off and um, it was just after lockdown and it was really nice because the first time a load of us had seen each other in like two okay. or three years so it was a proper big reunion so what that was good fun to that's feel. annoying me that has because i haven't had no, the good. ability or um, the opportunity to watch that yet and it is actually something probably in the past six months that i've actually wanted have to watch with me and the missus and the, and, and the kids and that. But again, it's had time to come around to it. You didn't miss much. Well, right. Okay. So, right then. So, I, I've i never watched the original. I've never <laughs> watched any of it. So, I don't know the story. So, 30 seconds, sum it up. Well, the TV series, me and my dad watched the first two episodes. And I kid you not, one thing happened. In two episodes, one thing happened. It was so slow. And we just went, right, we've seen our scenes. We're happy. we sorted. You know. And I think someone, well, for my dad, it was actually really good being in the TV series because my dad was in the original Willow. So to be in the original and then pop up again yeah. in the TV series, it was good. And because of the main film, you know, because yeah. of this film, so it does, I think it does mean a lot to my dad. But yeah, the TV series was absolute garbage. Yeah, no, I, I, obviously, I, I don't want to talk about people that aren't in the room and, and whatnot now. But your dad's, your dad's been in Star Wars as well, hasn't he? Yeah, my dad's an Ewok in uh, Star Wars Return of the Jedi. That's how I got into the acting business, yeah. because of him, and he kept in touch with... Cause he stopped in the 90s when he met my mum yeah. and had me and my sister, but he kept in touch with a lot of his friends. So I've like grown up around him being an Ewok, around people that I know being in Harry Potter and stuff. Yeah. Just, that's normal to me, you know. And then I left school, and I thought, You're going, yeah, go on, I'll apply, I'll uh, sign up for this agency. And I'd had a load of friends do Panto, saying, oh, you need to do Panto, it's brilliant. I went, yeah, okay, I'll do Panto, see what it's like. And if I don't like it, I won't do it again if I like it, you know. So that was in 2017, because in Middlesbrough, best job I've ever had. I absolutely loved it. I remember really? like, getting to the end of the first week and going, like, this is just still rehearsals, going, I want to do this every Christmas, this is just absolutely brilliant. And Fantastic. it gave, because the first time I'd move away, moved away from home for an extended period of time, it was like six weeks with a few of the other guys in this house. And it gave me the confidence I never knew I needed. Like, I was always a confident person, but it just gave me way more in myself to go, I can do this. I can be, I can be on stage performing in, hundreds, in front of hundreds of people. And it gave me, I, I grew up a bit over Panto, you know. So my family may argue against that point. But it's like, I've always loved Panto. Because for me, it's my time away from my family, away yeah. from my friends, my time to be me grow up learn a few new things you know 
No, it's good. And have you found, I want to move to your sort of at your comedy side now, because that's how I know you through, sort yeah. of, uh, through the Derby Comedy Writers Club. Not that I was that funny and, you know, that's why I retired from comedy. But, um, you know, have you found that that has been able for you to switch into comedy? Because I know, I know being on stage, in, you know, instead of like 10 of you being on stage, there's one of you and it's like focused on you. Do you? Do you find that that affects with your mental health differently? Do you find that that play, you know, you have to be a different person? How's that work? Well, it was actually through the panto I got into comedy because basically one day the woman playing Snow White brought her little girl on stage, it was about two at a time or whatever, and just I just happened to say, oh, finally, there's somebody shorter than I am, <laughs> you know. Got a massive laugh from the uh, cast, and this bloke who was playing the dame, a lovely bloke called Sean Prendergast, came over to me and he said, um, George, can you do me a favour when Panto's finished? I went, yeah, sure, what? He went, become a comedian. I went, you what? And it was like one of those things I'd always had in the back of my mind. But you know, it's like those pipe dreams we all have, going, oh, in another life I could have done this. But and he went, yeah, you need to become a comedian. And everyone in the cast got wind of it. He went, yeah, George, you need to do it. You're so funny. You're naturally funny. I went, okay, yeah, go on then. So I finished Panto, and I looked, up, looked online. I found a six-week course in London run by a bloke called Logan Murray. It was really handy because I was filming a Disney Plus film called Artemis Fowl at the time. So I was, I was filming during the week. <laughs> I was filming during the week, then doing this workshop at the weekend. So yeah, I did my first gig, first five minutes. And again, like Panto, I came off stage going, I want to do more of that. You know, <laughs> that was just mad. And, and, and I've, the audience, obviously, I'm used to it because of Panto. And it is quite nice being the only one. Because in Panto, if you cock up, there's other people to save you. Whereas if comedy is almost a challenge going, yeah, you can cock up a bit and make it work. Not like not like theatre, let's say, not like the West End. And in comedy, I've got more con- way more control over it because it's my jokes, it's said how I like it, it's written how I like it. Um, I know it's on what I want to do. Obviously, the only thing I don't control is how long I'm doing. But it's like I have way more control over it. And I'm more used to that. I do it more frequently on than the acting. And the buzz you get from a brilliant gig oh it's an electric like they come off stage to, and you're feeling electric and I love this nothing beats it and it's like your ultimate kind of high have you had any bad shows have you had any shows where you where it's gone like fuck that went completely fucking wrong that did and like obviously you've, you, you're learning for every show and uh, new material and seeing what kind of works like how was yeah, that yeah. kind of Firstly, how was the very first show you'd done? And then secondly, have you had any like bad shows where it's just gone wrong? Uh, yeah, I've had bad shows. Um, I've had a few that I'll talk about. So last night, for example, I was in Doncaster. And it was a paid gig. So I'm starting to break into paid work, which I'm really happy with. And the guy, already I was a bit apprehensive about this gig because the MC was also the headliner, which I'd never heard of before. I'd heard of the MC being the opening act at the time, but never the headliner. I was thinking, okay, how's this going to go, you know? got there it's like this working men's club i was thinking okay let's see how this goes i was on first and the lighting just wasn't working for whatever reason so i went on to on stage with just really fucked up lighting and i don't think that helped the audience and then there was a table in front of me that was just chatting for out and i, I was tempted but i didn't but i was just wanting to go shut the fuck up you know i'm trying to perform here and it's like some gigs that i've so some jokes i do which i know knock it out apart we're getting a few laughs it's like Oh, thanks, you know. And it's like, oh, and it's get you can see the whole night the guy clearly booked us because he wanted a comedy night more than they wanted a comedy night, you know. But yeah, I've done gigs where the audience has just been split like separate, so you'll have like two people over there, three people there, five people there. It's like you no, know, because it really takes it away. But I think for me, one of my personal worst ones of it's early this year. I uh, did the Leicester Comedy Festival. And I did my own show, which I've got. And the first night I did it, I had a genuine audience member, one bloke. And about three friends who and I, I knew from the, who were also comedians. One bloke who worked for the company that put the show on, and one dude. And he was, it wasn't like he was a laugher. He was just a, yeah. He was more of a nodder. So I was supposed to do this hour's worth of comedy. I think got through it in like half an hour because I hated it. And like the next day, I remember having it on my mind all the time and it didn't I like I just had a shit day the next day because of that. I just couldn't get it out of my head. And 
comedians as general we tend to remember the bad gigs a lot more than remember the good gigs you know the good gigs yeah we'll get a high afterwards but then when we crash because i've had a few gigs where absolutely brilliant i've had been on a proper high been on a high the next day i've been up here and then, and then you go like oh crap now i've, I've got the blues you know i want to and especially when you apply for gigs and you don't get and no one's getting back to you and then see all your mates gigging and saying oh we've done this gig we've done that gig thinking crap okay why, why can't i get those gigs you know what can i what am i not doing so what am i not doing that i should be doing to get these gigs and to get more gigs and a comedian is always their own worst enemy and a gig always goes differently to what we remember like i've done gigs when i've come off stage going it was okay, you know, I could have done better, I could have done worse. Watched the video back and gone, wow, that actually went a lot better than I remember. You know, I, I don't remember the laughter in that much in that bit. I don't even remember any laughter in that bit, and there is laughter. You know, so for some reason we're always getting in our own heads, and especially because we do the same material most nights, we're going, oh yeah, but is that joke any funnier? To, is that joke still funny? Is it still going to work? And then, oh, but there's nothing worse than every comedian's like this. Where you write a joke, you think, oh, this is brilliant. This is absolutely going to hit out of the park. It's one of the best jokes I've ever written. You do it on stage. <laughs> you think, well, shit. You know, I really like that joke. And now I've got to get rid of it because no one likes it. So, yeah, so that can play with your mental health a bit going, wait, is it me? Is it them? Who is it? It could be, like, there, there must be. Did you hear the, right? Because I can't. The... There must be a an aspect of the comedy side that you do that can be, uh, as you say, very mentally challenging because you're always trying to like outdo yourself in a sense. You're always, you know, you're if you've got yeah. you know four of you um, on for the one show, you're always comparing yourself then to how your show went to how that comedian went. You, it's it's 100%. not the same, but it's a little bit similar. That I compare myself to the job I work in. There's a guy that does the same role as me. He's been doing it for like 15 years. I've been doing it for like a year. And I'll compare myself to him going like, why am I not getting the sales he's getting? Why yeah. am I not getting, doing this that he's doing? And it's like, well, hang on a minute. He's done 15 fucking years. Like, he's, he's got the experience. He's got the time under his belt. Like, that. that's why yeah. all I can do is just try and improve myself little by little, you know, just re- real slow progress and that, and then get to that yeah. point. And then when I'm at that point, there'll be someone behind me that's going, fucking hell, I wish I was as good as him. And it's, it's that mindset we have where we're always trying yeah. to Mm. almost try and get something that's out of reach the whole time like there's always that little bit too far that you're like oh that's what i want that's oh, what always. i want i want i'm gonna get mm. there it's... but something that's really helped something that's really helped with me and my mental health is the community like i've got a group chat on facebook with uh, some other comedians there's loads of us and we're always supporting each other there's no like obviously we know a few comedians that are bitchy and you know, just want to slag people off. You get that in any line of work, whatever life you live. You're going to get people like that. Like that. But this group chat has got people like Alex Lee, Katie yeah. Brown, Dan Live, Sandra De Cristo, just to name a few. You know, we're all really supportive. And if we, we always go, oh, guys, I've got this new joke. Can you see what it's like? And we'll give like constructive criticism. We'll go, oh, that's really funny, but try twisting it this way. Try. And we're never going to go, we never go, oh, I, I want that joke. It's like, no, this is, and sometimes we've gone, oh, I've just thought of a new bit for you. There you go. This is like, and we give it to them. And like, it's, that can really help, especially when we do a gig with them. If you do a gig with people, you know. Obviously, it is nice to, and I do like it sometimes to do a gig where I don't know anybody else on the bill. It is obviously meeting new people, seeing new styles of comedy. But if you do a gig with your friends and you smash it, like they will just be, and they'll be like praising you all on Facebook and in message, you go, wow, thank you. You know, that means everything you know getting people's so as comedians that's what we want more than anything is people's approval people's appraisal you know and like the biggest when if you're a comedian the biggest uh, compliment you can get is what an applause break so when people are clapping you're joking you've got to physically stop speaking so they can stop laughing and stop clapping you're thinking yeah i'm stopping because you love it so much you know and i've done uh, gigs there used to be in derby a comedy club called ruffle it's closed now but it was brilliant i did it like every other week i'll go there for the two nights and it was brilliant that crowd were there for comedy 
you know, like uh, Brian will be able to say, we've done gigs in pubs where people just want to have a pint and a pack of crisps. They don't give a shit about you. No. You know, no. you're interrupting their night. Whereas this place, it was a, they were there for you. And I think I did one night where in the first five minutes of my 20 minute set, I had two applause breaks. It was like, fucking hell, this is brilliant. And like, I did a weekend, it was with Alex Lee, so on the Friday we had a brilliant audience. Then the Saturday night audience was way better. It was like, jeez, you know. I Like, you can't get much better than that. Applause break, people coming up afterwards going, oh, you're brilliant. And a few weeks a few weeks ago, me and Alex were having a few drinks in Derby. And, like, we did this gig in January, so this is about, like, June time. And two women came up to us and went, are you comedians? I went, yeah. I went, oh, we, used, we watched you once in a ruffle. Back in January, remember you, you're really funny. Like, wow, thank you. You know, you remember six months ago us performing and you us being funny. And those random comments like that just go, I'm really happy now. And I remember I was just starting out as a comedian and just done this uh, about five, ten minutes at this event that my friends were organising. And so the next day I was in town with my friends and this car was pulled up next to me and then the window went, you're a comedian, aren't you? Went, yeah. Went, oh, I watched you last night. You're brilliant. I just thought I'd say hello. Like, oh, thank you so much. And my friends turned around, just had this biggest smile on my face, going, that's what I've been waiting for. You know, I've got a fan, <laughs> you know. And people are always messaging me and going, oh, when's your next gig? I really want to see your gig. I really, don't please let me know when you're nearby. I really want to watch you perform, you know. Oh, good, man, good. And just before... Just before that, I, I realised my mic was on mute. Um, and when, when you're saying, uh, "Can you can you hear me?" Uh, yes, my my actual thing that I said was um, about the jo- joke. Your jokes falling on sort of deaf ears. That your new jokes and stuff. It's obviously the wrong crowd for you, George. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all I'm saying. Um, so just, I kind of want to bring. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to close it because I'm, I'm, I'm love listening to to kind of your, your points of view and your story and stuff, but. I just kind of want to touch now a little bit about advocating. So beyond act- advocating for like actors with dwarf dwarfism, you know, um, do you see any other areas in the entertainment industry where there is a lack of sort of representation and, and steps that can be taken to uh, sort of address the issues and stuff? Uh, I'm not sure, really. I think it's just mainly acting. Like I said, I can't remember which interview I said it in, but there should have been someone on the Wonka set at some point should have gone, hang on a minute, something about this ain't right. Like, films need the almost a disability coordinator to go, right, yeah, you're doing this right, you're doing that right, but that needs a bit of tweaking, that needs a bit of tweaking. Do it like this and you'll be absolutely fine. Now, obviously, I know not everyone's going to be happy with the end result. You know, if, if they'd used the dwarf to play in a room for some, other dwarfs would have been in up for, but those dwarfs that would have been in up for aren't in the entertainment world. Those right. are the people that are having a go at me. Yeah. that aren't in the entertainment world, so aren't seeing it from our point of view. They don't Do you, get uh, why we're moaning. They go, right. going, oh, you just want to be so t- uh, typecast. You don't. Want, you just want to make people laugh at us. Like, um, no, read what I'm putting, you idiot. Do you find that difficult then, you know, when, when you kind of, you, you, you put yourself, you know, into the spotlight, you know, you intentionally put yourself into the spotlight, and then you get another... Um, people with dwarfism and stuff turning around to you and saying and he, and like i said earlier as well about people that are getting offended on your behalf so to speak does that kind of get to you sort of your mental health when you think well am, am i actually doing the right thing here or am i um should i be doing this do you, do you ever bit, get yeah, into that sort like, of headspace yeah a bit yeah but then it's like then i see that it's that's like one comment in part pile of other really good ones but yeah like going back to the comedy that one comment is the one you remember. Like, you could have hundreds and thousands of people saying they love you, but one person say, oh, this joke was shit, and that would be the one bit that sticks in your mind. It's always going to be like that. But, um, like, it did actually make me laugh, because that's what I want, like to do with stuff like this. I'll just laugh at it. Like, the one woman put on, like, really having a go at me. So I deleted the comment and blocked her on, and removed her from Facebook. And then, her mum had a go at me saying, oh, you're getting rid of free speech just because she disagreed with you. And I replied to her going, she tried to get rid of my free speech saying I was wrong. And I removed her because I'm going to be posting more about the story in the next few days and she won't want to see it. So I removed her to help her. So why am I the bad guy? You know, and she never replied to that. So I think she must have got rid of them and went, 
yeah, all right, he's right, but I don't want to admit it. And like another yeah. dwarf uh, a poster put on had a go at me. But yeah, thankfully, a load of other comedians, a load of my other friends backed me up and said, jo- read what George has put. You're just jumping on a bandwagon saying he wants to do all these roles, but he's not saying that. He's saying he wants to do everyday roles, but he isn't getting them, so he needs this. Yeah. And like dwarfs, and they're trying to argue against it, and everyone's just having a go at him. And I got a voice note from a really good friend of mine called Jay Lustig, who's another dwarf actor, just absolutely pissing himself, going, God, you've pissed in his cheerio- Cheerios, haven't you? Keep it up, you know? It's brilliant. Keep it up. And it's comments like that from other dwarf actors going, yes, George, thank you. Keep it up. Come on, George. You know, and well, as I it. said, it's 2023. I know I'm going to get some feed, uh, backlash, no matter what I do. But it's my opinion. You can't do anything. Like, is that, for example, my, my parents have got a lot of friends who are dwarfs who are not in the industry, and they're scared they're going to get some backlash. And the same, but what they say to them is, I'm 26. I'm allowed to have an opinion different to yours. You can't stop me put saying my opinion. You can't shut me up. No matter no matter how hard you try, I will come back fighting even harder. Twenty six. I thought you were thirty two. Fuck off. <laughs> it's like saying though, like people. You will, get your bus pass soon, don't what you? What you don't want from <laughs> from this, and uh, I, I think I'm on the right tracks now. It's like from your argument, comment, your opinion, your 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 story. What you don't want is to is for them people to go well. If he thinks like that, everyone with dwarfism thinks like that. Cause it's bullshit. As you say, you have your own opinion, your own story, oh, yeah. and that's what you're doing is simply using yeah. your voice, like we say, and you're sharing your story. Mm. Now, the, the the thing with yeah. obviously the whole yeah, it's like um, Hugh Grant thing and that. Obviously, the thing that's getting in my mind at the moment is that. There is an argument to be made there. I'm in agreement with that, with you on that. Um, that stuff needs to be looked at. And then I'm also, the mental health side of me is going, how is Hugh Grant feeling hearing this feedback? How is that affecting him in his mindset? Of Because if I put myself in his shoes and is gone... Do you know what I've been in my mind? I've been given this role because I was the best actor on the day. Let's say for argument's sake, but now I'm getting this backlash. How does that affect me? Again, yeah. I think if we could know, I think if everyone knew the backstory of it, of was it a full casting? Was there who who, who was casted? How many? You know, was uh, dwarfs cast? What, what was they not? What yeah. was it a case of like right? Here's a load of money. That's you in it. I think if that story was there, I think it would put it would allow people to then make their own decisions. Whereas at the moment, again, people are seeing a one tiny clip and that's it. They're just like running into a brick wall. There's, there's two, there's two truths to everything and there's two sides to everything. Mm. And I, I think people, yeah, exactly. I, I think I that, yeah. again, if it was a case of, as you say, like you said earlier, if, if it was a case of there was a hundred auditions and he was generally the best one, then fair enough. You, you can't, it's, but you, you have to at least, yeah, w- we, we, no. we don't know if, if people like, have been allowed what you're the saying option. About one of us, yeah, but like going back to what you're saying about one of us thinking before us all, my friend, one of my best friends was looking at the comments and people were going, yeah, but I thought Peter Dinklage said they didn't want these roles anymore. It's like, yeah, just because Peter said it doesn't mean I'm saying it. Like, people don't think because one dwarf said it, all of the dwarfs agree with him. It's like, no, we're not all the same person, you know. We're just small. Even though we're all small, we all have our own mindset, our own opinions on it. So he may not want the role, but it's like people, that's what Hollywood said. Oh, one dwarf said no, so all dwarfs will say no. Yeah, I find, no. I find that I find that quite, you know, I, I know which interview you're on about, and I quite, I quite yeah. find that um, a little bit shocking, from, especially coming from Peter Dinklage, because his career has been made off, for me, two certain roles. One was um, Elf. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he you know, he, he owned that role, you know, with the, you know, call me dwarf one more time. <laughs> you know, yeah. And that sticks in my head. And then the other one was Game of Thrones. Yeah. You know, massive, massive sort of world, world renowned sort of TV program. You know, you look at the cast out on that and his role come from, you know, his, his, you know, so why, why is that being closed down to, to everybody else? You know what yeah. I mean? He, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's like tough, he can it's afford. Tough to not do the roles that we need. Like, yeah. for example, Hugh Grant can afford to 
skip a paycheck or two. He can afford to skip a film or two. Yeah. People like us can't. And if I could chat to him and the casting director, my question would be, why? That's yeah. what I want to know. That's what I want to know more than anything is why. And I, and I would quite like to have a chat with him. But um, everyone contact Warner Brothers and him for comment, and neither of them have replied. So I'm just imagining Warner Brothers is just like, who the bloody hell is George Coppin? And why do we keep getting asked to comment on his story? You know? I've got a surprise for you, George. Oh, I've got right. somebody from Warner Brothers on the line. The show. <laughs> 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 hey, we can't afford that. Been sat in the Sorry, George, we cannot afford that. George. No, we can't afford that line up. No. <laughs> is it Peter Dinklage? <laughs> Mate, I, well, I, I just yeah. didn't want to say anything. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Hugh Grant. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, guys, yeah. we haven't, we haven't, we haven't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so, George, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Honestly, Welcome. you know, we, we've got nobody in the background, you know, you scrap all that. Uh, yeah. But what I do want to say, George, you know, thank you so much for coming on. And, you know, it has been. A great conversation. Um, you know, if somebody can uh, want to go and watch you, but, you know, please do. He is genuinely a funny bloke. Um, you know, so what have we got coming up, George? Have we got any sort of shows people can come to watch? Yeah, I've got uh, various comedy gigs here and now. Um, for if anybody lives in the East Midlands, specifically Derby, I run a monthly comedy night at a place called Peacock Lounge in Park Farm and Alice Street. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, let me just get when the next date up is... Yeah, I've got, um, if you live in Northampton, I'm there this year doing Panto. So really look forward to that one, which, I, yeah, as I said, absolutely love Panto. Uh, if you live in Matlock, I'm going to be in Matlock on the 13th of August at Matlock Comic Con. I do a lot of Comic Cons with my dad. Uh, so, yeah, Peacock's next one is 21st of September. If you can't make that one, on the 2nd of November at the Peacock Lounge, I'm doing my Nottingham Comedy Festival preview which I'm then doing the show in Nottingham Comedy Festival on the 5th of November. So if you just go to Nottingham Comedy Festival, type in George Coppin. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's Coppin, C-O-P-P-E-N, 1412. I put everything on Instagram. I'm always on there. Yeah, just follow me there. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah. No, 1412. <laughs> no, no, guys, we will put the, the links for your socials will, and these dates and everything you can into... find onto the description yeah. below. So make sure you hit the description and have a look for that yeah but yeah george mate thank you so much mate this has been yeah, a you know he is a genuine fantastic you know. open and frank conversation thank you for asking it's me, generally guys. been an insightful conversation i have learned yeah, it has it mate. has oh I've no it has i've been corrected <laughs> i've been corrected george okay. i'm going to show one, mate. i'm going to i can edit it out yeah <laughs> 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 yeah uh, but no, George, I just want to say thank you very much. Jack. Pleasure. As always, you've been ginger. Um, ginger. And what I'm going to say, folks, is, you know, as I always end the, end the show, stand up, speak out, and remember, use your voice. <laughs>